Have you ever thought about going on a safari to Africa to see the wild animals? I've visited the area five times in my life. I thought you might be interested in seeing what you might expect if you took such a trip yourself. What animals can you expect to see? How close can you get to them? What are the accommodations like? Well, one of the big animals you are almost certain to see are lions. Lions make a kill, eat until their bellies are full, and then they just rest and sleep for days. As a result, once a pride of lions has been spotted by one guide, all the other guides learn about it, and there's plenty of time to get the tourists to see the lions sleeping. Despite this, tourists cause a traffic jam when lions are spotted. Long telephoto lenses are recommended. This is a wildebeest. It's resting and chewing its cud. You'll notice it has a beard and small horns. You'll generally see them in large groups. Normally, they're on the move, looking for nice grass to eat. I took this trip to Africa in the rainy season, February, a time when there is a great migration to take advantage of the new grass. Wildebeest are a favorite meal for a lion. As I mentioned, once the lion's belly is filled, it rests and it could care less about other food walking around nearby. Each animal has its own comfort zone. Now, most of the wild animals don't consider a truck filled with tourists as a threat. Some animals, like lions, will let a tourist vehicle get very close without getting spooked. So it's very likely you will get good and close to a lion, close enough to see all the flies that are bothering the lion. King of the beast? Maybe. Pleasant life? I'm not so sure. Another big cat you might see is a leopard. Leopards aren't so common as lions, and so they're not often seen on a given trip. I saw a leopard on only two of my five trips to Africa. After making a kill, a leopard spends its time safely resting up in a tree. I've only seen leopards sleeping, but I've talked to tourists who have seen a leopard dragging its kill up a tree. Now that would be exciting. The prey of choice for the leopard is the Thompson gazelle, the Tommy, or a wildebeest calf. This calf we see here is lost and won't be live very long. The young Thompson gazelle is also a prize meal. You will certainly see the Thompson gazelle and other gazelles of about the same size. The tail on the Tommy seems to be swinging around back and forth all the time. It has distinctive markings of a white belly, a black stripe, and then gradations of brown. The Tommy is also the favored prey for another large cat, the cheetah. Many animal species, the cheetah included, time their birthing period to the rainy season, when there's plenty of food and water for their prey. 
I've seen a cheetah mother with five cubs. The cheetah cubs are very vulnerable and most are killed by predators before reaching even an immature status. And the cheetah is another animal that makes a kill then rests for a long period of time. Typically, a cheetah will try to make a kill once a day, then rest the remainder of the day. The cheetah, particularly with kittens, will not tolerate vehicles getting close, and it will get up and move to a safer place if it feels threatened. Once one tourist guide has spotted a cheetah, it isn't long before he has told other guides. Here, the mother is calling the kittens to follow her. This cheetah's kittens come running after her. One is reminded of the survival of the fittest. It's also during the rainy season that wildebeest mothers give birth. The process of birth for a wildebeest takes only a minute or two. Then the calf is on the ground, wet, and must be strong enough to stay with the mother. There are thousands of calves during the birthing period, yet each mother knows which is its calf and rejects any other calf. The mother has almost no motherly instinct, as far as I could tell. The mother moves without regard to its calf. The calf must stay with the mother all the time. Once the calf has lost its mother, the mother just goes on about its business, seemingly unaware that her child is missing. The rainy season is a great time for the lions and other predators. The number of available wildebeest makes it easy for the lion to get a meal when it wants a meal. Now, when a lion is finished with a carcass, other animals move in to complete the task of stripping the carcass of anything edible. One of these is the vulture. And again, the vulture leaves a good life during the rainy season. The vultures have almost no feathers around their necks, and this is because they stick their head and neck into the carcass. So that's a modification to the bird that took place over time. The marabou stork, another scavenger, waits patiently for their turn at the table. None of these birds strike me as handsome. Efficient? Yes. Good-looking? No. Now, on your safari, you'll find yourself in a vehicle and driving a lot as your guide tries to find new animals for you to see. The area inhabited by the animals is vast in size, and the animals can move many miles over the period of a night. This road is a major road in the Serengeti. It has been graded, and there's a foundation of gravel. Often, these major roads have serious washboard surfaces. Almost all the tourist vehicles are Toyota pickup trucks, which have been modified to carry five to seven people. It's the one vehicle which seems to have been able to withstand the tortures 
of safari driving conditions. Another important predator and scavenger is the hyena. The hyena has been known to hunt and kill in packs, but most of the time it scavenges. It comes in after the kill and cleans up the carcass. It can even eat bones. Again, the hyena is not very good looking to my eye. As your guide drives you around looking for animals, he may not spend much time with hyenas. Most people want to see the big, good-looking animals. But not all the animals are beautiful. For example, an animal which even looks worse than the hyena to my eye is the warthog. It's a herbivore. Note how it gets down on its front elbows to eat the grass. Warthogs often are alone, but some are found in small groups. Behind the warthog's formidable face is a mild and inoffensive creature. The warthog is the most common pig in East Africa. A full-grown, average warthog weighs about 180 pounds and is about three feet long. It has two sets of tusks, the upper and the lower set of tusks. The uppers are used for digging. There's a crest of bristles running down along the top of its back. Now, the elephant is a favorite tourist attraction. It's very large and thus easy to spot. If there are elephants in the neighborhood, your guide is very likely to find them for you. These huge animals are a special curiosity because they use their nose, their trunk, to perform all kinds of tasks. Perhaps of all the wildlife in the world, elephants have more human-like habits than any other animal. Besides the elephant's trunk, it also has two tusks made of valuable ivory. It's because of the ivory that many elephants are killed each year just to get their tusks for the illegal black market. Although most elephants don't want trouble, they will charge a tourist vehicle which is getting too close and menacing. Elephants love to take a bath or a mud bath. Elephants are so large that the process of getting up and down is a challenge. They use their tusks to help them get up in certain circumstances. They are descendants of the mammoths and the mastodons of old. Most elephants are gregarious and live in herds of a dozen or more individuals. Because they are big, they require 30 to 50 gallons of water a day, plus 300 pounds of vegetation a day. An elephant can uproot a tree. They can be very destructive in their search for food. For all his clumsy-looking walk, an elephant can charge at 25 miles an hour for a short period of time. Now, the giraffe is the tallest animal on Earth. They eat the greenery from the top of an acacia tree. The greenery is protected by long, sharp needles or thorns, such as you can see in this picture. But somehow, these thorns don't bother the giraffe. Another big animal you may see is the hippopotamus. A hippo spends its days in the water and comes out at night to forage. It has a big mouth. Its yawn is something to behold. And just when you think it can't open any larger, whoa! They spend their days sleeping 
in the water. And still another large animal is the rhinoceros. These you don't see so often. They are shy and tend to be at great distance. I did see two during this trip and was fascinated by their urination process. The muscles in their bladders must be very strong to create such a jet of liquid like this. This is the only animal in Africa that will attack for no reason at all. Now, the weather is not always nice when you're on a safari. Maybe you can see the rain coming down in this picture of a bachelor bull elephant grazing. Now, the occasional rain shower doesn't affect the animal's behavior, but when it's a downpour, then the animals do try and cope. Here, the wildebeest have moved tightly together, facing downwind to provide some individual protection. As a tourist, bad weather makes it more difficult to find and observe wild animals. These marabou storks look miserable in this downpour. So I was surprised when a couple of immature lion cubs were enjoying the rain, playing tug-of-war with the wildebeest hide. The older lions were trying to ignore the cold, wet rain. They looked a little bit unhappy. Now, you want a driver who is experienced in spotting wild animals, for sure, but you also want one who knows how to drive in wet, unreliable terrain. You'll note that this truck is driving in the tracks, which are grooves from previous vehicles. The driver tries to turn his front wheels to the left to get out of the tracks, but the tracks are too deep and slippery. So again, you want to avoid inexperienced or careless driver guides. They can get you into trouble. Driving here can be tricky. On a typical safari, you are served basic but very fresh and well-prepared food after a long day's ride. And you'll leave your camp fairly early in the morning, leaving your tents behind. Now I want to talk about birds. We have the blue heron in the United States and a number of the other bird species I saw in Africa. However, I discovered a lot of birds I had never seen before. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a good African bird book, so I'm not able to identify all these that I'm showing you, but I'm going to make a try. This is a secretary bird. This may be an auger buzzard. This is probably a red-billed hornbill. This may be some sort of a shrike. This may be a kukal. This is a fish eagle, a magnificent bird shot early in the morning. These are vultures. I'm guessing they're called white-backed vultures. This is a marabou stork. This may be a tawny eagle. This may be a kind of a stork. 
One of the mistakes I made on this trip was not asking my guide to identify all the birds we saw. Ah, this is a gray-crowned crane. And a friend suggested this is a blacksmith lapwing. Possibly a tawny eagle? Before you leave for Africa, I recommend you buy a good field guide for birds. This is a weaver's nest. This is a helmeted guinea fowl. Now, this is a cory bustard. Notice that in this picture, it's got a thin neck. Here, the same bird is in a display mode. Look at its neck now. This is a sacred ibis. And you'll know this, an ostrich. This is a very pretty mystery bird. It's ground loving. These white birds are cattle egrets. This might be some kind of a bustard. This bird makes an interesting sound, like kind of <laughs> This kind of looks like a green shank to me, but a friend said it looks like a sandpiper. Don't know what this one is. I'm sure you're going to find experts making proper bird identifications in the comments section of this video. So let's talk about some less famous animals now. These are banded mongooses, and their home is in a termite mound. This is a black-backed jackal, also known as a silver-backed jackal. It mostly scavenges for food. And this is a vervet monkey. It seems to search for food on the ground. And this is a Homo sapien with a 400 millimeter lens. The Homo sapien species seems to be attached to cameras. This is a family of baboons. They are often quite entertaining to watch. These are Topi, trying out their martial arts. Impala are graceful, known for their great leaps and curved shaped horns. This is an eland. They generally are quite shy and thus hard to photograph, even though they are large. Their bodies remind me of a cow. I believe this is a golden jackal. I watched it try and track down a rabbit, but the rabbit outsmarted the jackal. Oh yes, we haven't shown a zebra yet. Their young are born during the rainy season also. Almost any place you go in the rainy season, you'll find carcasses, stripped to the bone by the various scavengers who have been able to make a meal from the kill. So if you plan to take a safari in East Africa, you can expect to get some nice photos. But please, come prepared by practicing with your camera before leaving on the trip. There's no way to make repairs 
or buy some accessory once you arrive on your safari. And be prepared for both hot weather and for wet weather. And although most of your attention will be spent observing and photographing some of the marvelous wild animals in Africa, there's another aspect of your trip I think you should consider. And that is wandering through some of the local villages, perhaps meeting some of the people. In the villages, though, you'll want to keep your camera fairly inconspicuous. I hope you have a great trip to Africa on safari. <laughs>